Greetings and blessings from the south suburbs of Chicago, and welcome to the Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, where the lost can be found, where the dying can receive life, and where the saints can be encouraged. The Church of Love, welcome to the Church of Love. May all the people of God say amen, amen. and amen. amen. On behalf of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, I say to my fellow brothers and sisters within this great church of Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, good morning to you. And to all who are joining us throughout our nation, throughout the world, I may not know exactly all that you've been through since last Sunday. I may not know everything that you're going through right now. I do realize that someone somewhere is facing a prognosis or a diagnosis. Someone somewhere might have spent the past few days without electricity or power. Somebody somewhere has problems that they are worrying about that they awakened with and they are wondering how a solution will be brought about. But I can tell you this much. No matter what you have been going through and no matter what you have gone through since last Sunday, for you to be watching this live stream right now, for you to be here right now, for you to be in this moment on the Sabbath day, it means no matter what you went through last Sunday, God brought you all the way through everything that you were going through. So we give him the glory. We give him the praise. We give him the credit. We give him the honor. For he is worthy of all praise. And so, on behalf of this great church family, on behalf of every ministry, on behalf of our great music ministry and media ministry, on behalf of our deacons ministry and our trustees ministry, on behalf of every member of Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, we say to all who are joining with us this morning, good morning, God bless you, and may the Lord receive all praise and all glory this morning, for he is good and he's worthy. We're so blessed this morning to be joined by members of our beautiful church family. So blessed to be in the presence this morning. We thank God for Pastor Willie Baker, who is present with us. And if you have your Bibles with you, uh, if you would for a moment just journey with me to Paul's letter to the Galatians. We shall be looking at chapter 2. If you are able to stand for the reading of God's word, we invite you to do so. We are in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians. I shall be reading verses 11 through 14 from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Holy Word. And the word of the Lord reads, but when Cephas, who was Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned for until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, 
I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to preach from the title, and you may be familiar with this language if you know anything about the beautiful game of basketball. We often call the number one guard the point guard. And then we call the five position, which is the center, the post. So I would like to preach from the title this morning, the point and the post. The point and the post. Merciful God, as we now journey into this, the truth of your word, we pray that just as the apostle Paul spoke of the truth of the gospel, that the truth of the gospel shall be fully applied to our hearts right now at this moment. Lord, may your servant be ever invisible before your people that your word shall be fully visible. May it strengthen us and fill us. And Lord, we pray at this moment that these verses of this chapter, of this letter to the Galatians, shall be fully applied to our lives and to our hearts. This we humbly request in the almighty name of our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And may all of God's people say amen and amen. Beloved, a community of faith is not like any other community. A community of faith neither possesses material in the form of something physical or something that can be counted. A community of faith possesses no material interest, as does a business. That is, it provides no traditional goods or services. To this point, the Internal Revenue Service even gives two different definitions for a church versus a religious organization. A religious organization can provide some type of good or service. It may be of a religious nature, but a religious organization is just that. It is an organization. The Internal Revenue Service says that a church or a place of worship provides intangible spiritual value. Intangible. That's something neither quantified nor qualified. That is something you cannot immediately or readily put your hands on. It's something you cannot touch. It is something that you cannot place into any category or genre. It is intangible. Anyone familiar with athletics knows that many times when evaluating an athlete, they will say, here are all of the things we can count, how fast the athlete can run or throw, but then they say we are looking for the intangibles. We're looking for the things that we cannot put into words. It is a certain something that the French call a certain je ne sais quoi. It means you can't put it into words, but you know it's there. You don't exactly know how to define it, but it's a something something that is there. So the IRS says that a church, unlike any other entity, provides a certain something. We can't put it into words, but we know that it's there. We don't know how to quantify it. We can't qualify it. We can't measure it, but we do know that it's there. A community of faith is just that. It's different from an organization. It's different from a corporation. It's different from a business. It's different from a group. It is a community based on faith. And in the sense of the church, it is a community centered around faith in Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a religion. It is a reality. It takes on some religious forms, but it's a reality. It's a way that you live. It's a way that you are. And it is centered around and based upon the person of Jesus Christ. So a community of faith is a community based on this one person, the Son of God, the Messiah. Everything flows through, is commanded by, everything is based upon looking to, looking unto, looking upon, looking up to Jesus Christ. That is a community of faith. And when our world finally recovers from the year 2020, 
when our society finally begins to recover from the violence and the brutality, when our society finally begins to recover from the events of this year, when we finally recover from the pandemic, when we finally recover from all of the protests, the riots and the violence, when we recover from the storms and the debris and power outages and disarray, when we begin to recover from reorganizing our school systems and colleges and universities and doing business differently, when we finally begin to recover, faith communities will have to be just that, faith communities. Meaning we will never go back to quote unquote business as usual. The church will look different. Churches will be different. Congregations will look different. And this is a good thing. That in the 21st century, we will go back to first century ministry. Just doing ministry. Being a faith community. When this world finally recovers, and it's going to take some time, we will find that country club Christianity will be dead. We will find that the evangelism of exclusivity is dead. We will find that social club salvation is dead. And the church will have to get back to being just that, a church. A place where people pray, a place where people read God's word, and a place where people worship the Lord. That churches will have to get back to being churches. Not a place for anything else except the worship and the glorification of Jesus Christ. Ministries will have to get back to just being ministries. No more bells and whistles. No more special effects. Just the gospel going forth. Just a place to praise the Lord. Just a place to read and understand the Bible. That when the world recovers, that's what the world will need. People will need a place where they can go pray. People will need a place where they can read the Bible. People will need a place where they can worship. That's all the church needs to be. There's a good thing that's coming up when we finally recover, that there will come a sense of remembrance. Oh, the church is where we go to worship the Lord. The church is where we go to serve the Lord. The church is where we go to understand God's word. The church is all about Jesus Christ. There are some people, millions and billions waiting, that when the time comes, when they get on the other side of everything that they've gone through, that when all the doors open back up, where they will be looking for a place where they can just pray and sing and worship and give God the praise, the church will now just have to be the church. Ministry will be all about ministry. And for this point and to this sense, what we will have to realize is it's a simple thing to do ministry. You just follow the Lord. That's all you have to do. It's a simple thing. You just look to him. You ask his permission before you do anything or say anything. Before you go anywhere, you, you stay on bended knee even when you're walking around. You stay in constant conversation with the Lord. It's a simple thing. And there comes a time where for every believer, for every Christian, there comes a time when we must know our own calling. Every Christian is called to something. Every Christian is called to do something. Every believer is called to a purpose. There comes a time when we all have to know for ourselves our own calling. There comes a time when we have to know our own calling in relationship to the callings around us. There comes a time when we must know our own purpose in relationship to the purposes around us. There comes a time when we must know who we are and who we are not. And there comes a time when we must simply do what God wants us to do. And we must do what God wants us to do whether we want to do it or not we must do what God wants us to do because he said so. A life with the Lord is a life of obedience. We must do what God wants us to do even when it's painful. Even when it's embarrassing. Even when it's dangerous. Even when it's uncomfortable. Even if it should cost us our lives. That's what we're called to do. To be obedient even unto death. To do what the Lord tells us to do. To do what the Lord requires. And knowing our mission. Knowing our calling. Knowing and clearly understanding our purpose in relationship 
to the other missions around us is like being on the basketball court. You see, you need five on the floor. But all five don't do the same thing. I'm talking about the fundamentals of basketball. I'm, I'm not talking about these, these new age centers who are so diverse that they can play power forward and might play the one and the five. I'm, I'm not talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo, brothers who are 6'10 and 6'11 who might pull up and shoot a three. I'm talking about the fundamentals. You see, I've had the joy as a father over the past few months. I've begun introducing my daughter to the beautiful game of basketball. And by the time she reaches the age of three, I'll introduce her to the sweet science of boxing and the wonderful game of football. But right now, I'm starting her off with the beautiful game of basketball. And in teaching her, before I teach her about the, the more alluring highlights, before I teach her about dunking and, and driving to the basket, I, I'm teaching her the fundamentals of the game, about the point guard and the role of the one. And sometimes you might have a two guard. And then traditionally you have two forwards. Sometimes one might be called a power forward. And traditionally in the fundamentals you have the big man or the big woman who you call the center, the five. Somebody whose job it is on defense to guard the basket, to grab the rebounds, to keep people out of the paint. And then on offense to make sure they don't get a three second violation by getting to the goal and by boxing up and by boxing out the other defender, and sometimes, fundamentally, they would even hold their hand up and call for the ball. I'm talking about the Alonzo Mornings of the world. I'm talking about the Patrick Ewings. I'm talking about the traditional big man who could get into the paint and get on the box and then would hold out their hand and call for the pass. I'm talking about Hakeem Olajuwon playing for the University of Houston, where you already knew what the play was going to be. Clyde Drexler would bring the ball down the court and give it to Olajuwon, and there was nothing the other team could do about it. That was the more traditional five on five. And in teaching her about that, I had to get back to explaining the role of the point in the post. You see, traditionally, the point guard would bring the ball down court. And even before teaching her about things like a two, three zone and teaching her about a zone defense and the difference between man to man or woman to woman defense and zone defense, I had to teach her about something as simple as the ball being checked in and bringing the ball down court. And traditionally, I'm going back to that Dean Smith style of, of basketball, that Coach K, Bobby Knight style of basketball, but especially Dean Smith, sometimes the one guard would hold up fingers in order to show a play to the other four players. It was all about the play that the coach had drawn up. It was all about all five players understanding their role on the, floor, on the floor. So the forward didn't try to do the job of the center. And the center didn't try to do the job of the one guard. And the two guard didn't try to do the job of the one guard. Sometimes the two guard was a good spot up shooter. So they knew it wasn't their job to drive to the basket. Sometimes you had a one guard who might distribute the ball but then get into the perimeter and take the shot. But they all understood their role. And when all five understood their role, they may not have always been friends off the court, but on the court there was a respect and an appreciation and a clear understanding of who did what. And they could work together and they could play together and they could win together because they all understood what they were supposed to do in relationship to who did what. If you understand the relationship between the point and the post, then you understand the relationship between Peter and Paul. That was their relationship. We don't know much about what happened off court between Isaiah Thomas and John Sally, but we know on court, one understood, one was the point and one was the post. We don't know much about what went on off court between John Starks and Patrick Ewing, but there was a clear understanding of who was who on the court. We do now, thanks to The Last Dance, know a little bit about what went on between Michael Jordan and Bill Cartwright. And that will be a prime example of, I can't imagine that they hung out off the court. But on the court, they understood what one was going to do and what the other was going to do. We don't know much about what happened off the court between Kobe and Shaq, but we do know enough about it to understand there was a conflict. Whose Lakers are they? Are they Kobe's Lakers or Shaq's Lakers? Living in LA at the time, 
I would hear both. Some people would say the Shaquille O'Neal Lakers or the Kobe Bryant Lakers. They might have won five more championships, but there came some conflict and some tension between whose team is it. But at the end of the day, Kobe certainly felt like as the one guard is my team. But Shaq was certainly dominant enough to feel like, well, without me, you're a different team, so it's my team. The point and the post have to have a clear understanding of who does what. And when you read the second chapter of Galatians, there comes some tension and some conflict between the point guard and the post. You see, Peter was the point guard, very clearly. Jesus appointed him in Matthew 16. He appointed him. He said, upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. At the end of John's account, it is very clear when Peter says to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. Jesus appoints Peter to go into the city to lead the other remaining disciples, the remaining ten, and to replace Judas. And he says, wait to be clothed with power from on high. It's Peter who preaches the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. Peter was clearly appointed as the leader. He's the one who went before the people and set the standard for what defined an apostle. That an apostle had to have seen Jesus in his earthly ministry before he was crucified and then had to have seen him after he was raised. Two men fit that description as far as Peter was concerned, Justice and Matthias. So then Peter went to the Lord and prayed, Lord, of these two men, which do you choose? And so the Lord told Peter to choose Matthias to replace Judas. Even in the Catholic tradition, they call Peter the first pope. Even the kings of the United Kingdom over in England, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland and Wales, they call their throne the Rock of St. Peter. Peter, who also goes by the name Cephas, the Aramaic word which means rock, a translation of Peter, which comes from the Greek Petros, where we get the word petrified. It's understood Peter was the rock. He was the foundation. So as far as he was concerned, it was his team that Jesus, the coach, gave him the team, that he was the floor general. And that for a very long time, he was playing against a team called the Sanhedrin, which was led by another point guard named Paul. But then Paul's agent called up the general manager of the church and he got traded and now he was playing for the church. But since the one position was already taken, then Paul being of enough stature took the five position and understood that now he would play the post. But there came this tension that there were some on the team who said, well, Paul, though he's at the post for a little while, he was a point guard. He can play both positions, but Paul was happy to say, I will play center now, and Peter will play the one position. So with that, there came a meeting in Jerusalem, and Luke describes this meeting in the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 29 in the Acts of the Apostles. There came the council at Jerusalem. And at this council, there had to be a decision what was to be done concerning how Gentiles would join the faith. And so Peter was of the position that Gentiles should be circumcised. That since the 17th chapter of Genesis calls for circumcision, that Gentiles should be circumcised. Paul was so opposed to this that one of his partners, Titus, was being pressured by a group called the Judaizers who wanted to circumcise him, a grown man. And Paul escaped with Titus and would not allow Titus to be subject to the Judaizers. So in Jerusalem, at the council, it was decided that Gentiles would not have to be circumcised, but they would have to refrain from eating unclean things. And Peter would go to the Jewish believers and preach to the Jews. And then Paul would preach to the Gentiles. They would play two different positions, playing for the same team, playing for the same coach, but Peter would stay in Jerusalem and primarily work in Judea. And Paul would go beyond Samaria to Asia Minor. He would go to Iconium and Lystra. He would go to Ephesus. He would go to Macedonia. And as we see here, he goes to Galatia. 
And he finds that the Galatians are still dealing with this conflict that he thought had been settled. And this tension between Peter and Paul takes this form in which Peter was sending people behind Paul to unteach whatever Paul was preaching. And so Peter was making the matter worse because it had been settled. What upset Paul was he knew that he met with Peter and the group. And this was not his first time meeting with Peter in Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem twice. Before he went with the council, even Paul tells the Galatians in the first chapter of this letter, I spent 15 days just with Peter and James so they would know my position on the Gentiles. Then later he went back and sat down with Peter and with everyone and brought Barnabas with him so that there would be clarity between the one and the five position on the court so that everyone would understand the play they were going to run. And yet, in this second chapter, Paul finds out that Peter has been speaking with two faces. In fact, he calls him a hypocrite. The word actor in Greek, it means two faces. That he's been saying one thing with one face and then putting on another face to say something else. So Paul, who was very much a face-to-face -face person, says, but when Cephas, who was Peter, came to Antioch, so by this point, Paul and Barnabas, along with Titus and Timothy and John, Mark and Silas, they had gone to Antioch and Peter came behind them. And when he did, Paul seized this opportunity to say to Peter, you've been saying something very different from what you said in Jerusalem when we met. And he's now telling the Galatians in this letter, I addressed Peter to his face. He says, but when Cephas, who was Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Not that he opposed him even in written letter, meaning Paul has some MC Hammer in him. What I mean by that is MC Hammer was known for going to see people face to face. MC Hammer was not of a social media generation. He wouldn't go back and forth with anybody. There was once a rapper by the name of Redman who at the age of 19 had made a comment about MC Hammer's mother. MC Hammer was not a battle rapper. MC Hammer didn't care about his lyrics. MC Hammer was from Oakland. He was from the Bay Area. He believed in man-to-man -man conversations. So Redman said that one day he was at MTV Studios about to record something and go on camera and do an interview on a show called Yo! MTV Raps. And because MC Hammer knew that Redman was there, Redman all of a sudden said, I looked up and I saw MC Hammer with about 50 guys, and these guys were not backup dancers. I could look at them and tell these, th these were not guys um, who were too legit to quit. Um, these were guys who were shoot first, ask later. He said, I'm from the streets. These were street guys. And MC Hammer brought 50 guys, and he pulled me aside, and he said, listen here, you a young boy. I'm 26, you're 19, so you don't know any better. So I'm going to tell you one time, because the next time I'm not going to tell you. You can say anything about me that you want. You can talk about my baggy pants. You can talk about the way I dance. You can talk about my music. That's fine. Talk about me all you want. But I'm going to tell you one time, don't you ever talk about my mama. He said, now, man to man, when you talk about a man's mama, he said, I'm going to let you know. I brought a few people with me, but I put some money on the street. 50000 if you ever say anything about my mama. And he said, I let the whole Bay Area know. Don't even come back to the Bay Area. If you ever think about talking about my mama, don't come back to L.A. Don't you ever talk about my mama. He said, my mama put food on my table. She put clothes on my back. My mama kept me in church. My mama's a saint. My mama's a loving woman. Don't you ever, ever talk about my mama. And he said, this is the last time I'm going to tell you. Red man said he went, yes, sir, Mr. MC Hammer. He said he sent him some flowers sent some cards to his mama, said, I apologize. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. And he said, I'm here to tell you, don't you ever disrespect MC Hammer's mama. He said, the MC Hammer, who says you can't touch this, he says that for a reason. And, and he said, now I know why his first album was called Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him. And he said, because in my mind, I was looking at all 50 of those guys, and I was thinking, please Hammer Don't Hurt Me. Paul had some MC Hammer in him. Paul was not going to go back and forth with Peter. He says, I opposed him to his face. He said, I went and got at Peter because we had an agreement and now I'm hearing something very different from what we talked about. He said, I opposed him 
to his face. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. Now he's really getting at Peter. He's saying, Peter knew better. You see, Jesus had made it a point to eat around Gentiles. And whenever Paul saw Peter, Peter wasn't eating around Gentiles. He's saying that some people who were close to the brother of Jesus showed up with Peter. And because they were close to James, the brother of Jesus, Peter was trying to show out and show off and act as if he was better than the Gentiles. And Paul saw this. And he's telling the Galatians, how can you listen to Peter when he's speaking with two faces? He says one thing in Jerusalem, but then does another thing when you see him in Antioch. And then he says, but after they came, Peter drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. That are those who came from James, the brother of Jesus, who believed Gentiles should be circumcised. But then he says, and other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy. They joined him in being two-faced. And if you read Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 41, you then see the conflict even reached Paul and Barnabas. It just wasn't John Mark that upset Paul. See, John Mark made Paul angry because John Mark had deserted him in a city called Pamphylia. And as far as Paul was concerned, if you weren't ready to die for the gospel, if you could be run off, he didn't want any cowards around him. So he stayed with Timothy and Titus and Silas, and he took them with him. But John Mark went along with Barnabas. But also Barnabas believed that Gentiles still had to be circumcised, and Paul did not. And he's saying that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were acting inconsistently, that is, they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before them all, again, he's saying, I did all of this out in the open. He said, I said to Peter before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, I want to pause with what he means by live like a Gentile. Paul is dealing with the truth of the gospel. Paul knew, and only Jesus could have revealed this to Paul, that in the sixth chapter of Matthew, when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, before he teaches them how to pray in verses 9 through 13 of Matthew 6, he spends a little time saying, do not pray like Gentiles. That is, don't do what they do. Set an example so they do what you do. Don't be like them. Live the kind of life that they want to be like you. Don't look at the world. The world should be looking at you. So he's saying to Peter here, Paul says, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to be like Jews? In other words, he's saying, if you can't live out the very thing you're asking them to do, then how can you expect them to live the way that they're supposed to live? He's saying you're not living it. And not only that, Paul then goes to the point of the matter. He knew that Peter had received a vision. And Luke records this vision. In Acts chapter 11, he sees a vision. And in that vision, Jesus said to him very clearly, he said to him that the Gentiles have received the full repentance of salvation. You see, Peter knew right from wrong. Peter knew that what he was doing was wrong. But Peter was so concerned with trying to impress James, the brother of Jesus. Though he was the point guard, he was trying to impress those who weren't on the team. Though he was the leader of the team, he was trying to impress somebody other than the coach. He was trying to impress the front office, trying to impress the pundits and the media, trying to impress the culture. He didn't understand he already had a role on the court. He was supposed to be the point guard and bring the ball down the court and distribute the ball and win the game. That was his job. And Paul was saying, how can I play the five position if you don't bring the ball down court? Peter, the point guard, didn't even want to look at Paul, didn't want to deal with him in this conflict because Peter, as the Bible records, never has a direct response to any of this except that he changes what he does later. This would say that Paul is not speaking from human authority. He is speaking directly from what Christ had revealed to him about the right and the wrongness of how the Gentiles were to be treated. And what this makes very clear 
is that the point and the post have to be on the same page. Even if they may not even sit down together at the same dinner table, they still have to be on one accord. You see, I talked about a lot of point guards and a lot of centers. You may have noticed I left somebody out. You may have noticed that I left out possibly the most famous point guard and center combination. Because in order to understand what Peter could have been helped by is to understand the Showtime Lakers. See, I'm not talking about the Kobe Lakers or the Shaquille O'Neal Lakers, the Showtime Lakers. You notice we never called them the Magic Johnson Lakers. We never called them the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Lakers. We never called them the Pat Riley Lakers. We called them the Showtime Lakers. They were known for being a team. They weren't known just for what one particular person would do. They were known in relationship to how they would do things. See, if I start naming Showtime Lakers, whether you know basketball or not, you have probably heard of Magic Johnson. If I name Showtime Lakers, you've probably heard of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We know them even by what we call the minor players. Kurt Rambis, A.C. Green, Michael Cooper, Byron Scott, James Worthy. We know that entire team. To play them was to play a team. There was only one time when Magic Johnson did not play the one position. It's when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar got injured in the finals and then Magic Johnson, who played center in high school, played center in that game because he could. But once Kareem Abdul-Jabbar recovered from his injury and came back the next season, Magic went back to the one, Kareem went back to the five because they understood the positions. But they were very different off the court. Off the court, it's not to say that they weren't friends, but they lived very different lives. They, they moved a little differently. Having lived in the city for a little while when I was there, Magic Johnson is kind of the unofficial mayor of Los Angeles. He's the person that everybody loves in the city. He's created not hundreds, thousands of jobs, launched thousands of careers, a philanthropist, some of us know about Magic Johnson theaters, but he has his own chain of TGI Fridays, his own. Even the logo was different. They're called Magic Johnson TGI Fridays, where the whole theme of the TGI Fridays is Magic Johnson's career. Has his own chain with the requirement that a certain number of employees be hired out of South Central, out of South Los Angeles, out of Inglewood. Magic Johnson worked with Coca-Cola to get scholarships through something called a Midsummer's Magic, where he would just sort of laud and give overwhelmingly to anybody in need. But Magic Johnson, during his heyday, um, also enjoyed, let's just say, his social life. Um, he was known for parties. He'd party before the game, after the game, probably thinking about a party during the game. Now, he got the job done, but he was very sociable, very likable. Kareem was likable, but it was a different kind of likable. Kareem was always missing from the parties. It was said you were not going to see him at the party before the game or after the game. You weren't going to see him in the club. You might catch him praying to the East, depending on the time of day, because he was and is a devout Muslim. Even when they ate, he wasn't going to consume pork or anything that would violate his dietary restrictions under his religion. If there was a matter of civil rights or unrest, he was going to be the first to speak out about it. You know, he should have been on the Olympic team. Easily could have been as Lou Alcindor, not as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Because he found himself politically unacceptable to the politically correct. You know, he just got a statue in front of the Staples Center. Just got one. Should have already had one. Do you know when you look at the numbers? Most people don't know Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scored far more points over the course of his career than Michael Jordan did. Far more rebounds, far more assists. That if you just look at the numbers, the numbers purely, the stats say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is actually the greatest player. But we don't think about him in that way because of the way he lived. So he and Magic had very different lives. But on the court, there was an understanding of the one and the five. Magic Johnson was most famous 
for the way that he would pass the ball. And he had a famous pass called the no-look pass, where he wouldn't look at the court. He would look away and throw the ball. He'd look over here and throw the ball. He'd look this way and throw the ball. He looked this way, over shoulder, behind the back, any, any direction, the no-look pass. Sometimes mid-dribble, he'd be dribbling, and mid-dribble, he might just pat the ball in one direction or another and pass it. But in doing so, it's not that he wasn't looking at the court. Turns out he was looking at Pat Riley. He was looking at the coach. Because the play was coming from the coach, it looked as if, he was looking away. He was looking away from the court because he understood what every player had in common was what was happening on the court based upon what the coach said. It wasn't about individual achie achievement. It wasn't about what they were trying to do as individuals. It was about what the coach had drawn up and the play that they were to run. It wasn't that he was just looking off anywhere. He was looking at the one who mattered. He was looking at the coach and getting his cue from the coach so he could look off at the coach and know what was happening on the court. He could look over at the coach and know what the five was doing. What Peter had stopped doing in this text and what Paul is calling him out on is he said somewhere you stop looking at Jesus and you started looking at people around the brother of James at some point you stopped looking at Jesus and you let yourself be judged by people at some point you stopped looking at the word and you started looking at the world and what we must do is seize this moment in history as the people of God to show all of the world that we're not going to look at the world, we're going to look at the word. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. No matter what is going on all around us, we're going to look up to the one who writes the plays. We're going to look up to the coach who tells us what to do. We're going to look up to the one who's already drawn it up the way that it's going to happen. When we play the point, we may bring the ball down, but that also means that all you got to do is look at the coach and you know what to do with the ball. If you're playing the post, you may be waiting for the rebound, but it doesn't matter what happens after you get the rebound because the coach has already told you what to do with the ball. If you're playing the post, you may take the shot whenever you're open, but don't worry about having to make the shot. The coach is going to draw it up and put you where you need to be so you can make the shot. If you're going to play the post, don't you worry about getting a three-second violation, but the coach is going to draw it up where you're going to be right underneath the basket to get the ball and score just the way you need to. If you're going to play the point, you don't have to worry about creating your own shot. The coach is going to draw it up where the shot is going to be waiting for you, where you're going to be right where you need to be, and the screen is going to be set so you can take the shot the way that you need to. Whenever you play the post, you don't have to worry about fighting underneath the basket, but the coach is going to draw it up where the ball is just going to fall right into your hands where you need it. Whenever you look to the Lord, you don't have to worry about what people are saying all around here because the Lord has already drawn up what he needs you to do the way that you need to do it. You keep looking at the one who saved you, not at those who can't save you. Keep your eyes on the one who makes you steadfast. Don't keep your eyes on those who stumble. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on him and not on television. Keep your eyes on the throne of grace, not on the White House. Keep your eyes on the deliverer, not on the destruction. Keep your eyes on the one who gives you power, not on your problems. Keep your eyes on the one who helps you overcome your worries, not on your worries. Keep your eyes on the one who is majestic, not on your misery. Keep your eyes on the one who gets you through your difficulties. Keep your eyes on the one who heals you when you need healing. Keep your eyes on the one who will help you overcome what you need to overcome. Keep your eyes on the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps. Keep your eyes on the one who will neither leave us nor forsake us. You don't have to look at what's going on right here. You can just give the Lord a no-look pass. Just keep your eyes on the Lord and you can pass when you need to pass. But you keep your eyes on the Lord. Look unto him who will carry you. Look unto him who will keep you strong. Look unto him who will keep you able. Look unto him who will give you rest. Look unto him who will anoint you afresh. Look unto him who will take you through your rough times. Look unto him who's your ever-present help in a time of trouble. Look unto him who 
who will provide all your needs. I hope you don't mind if I just have church for a little bit. Look unto him that you can look up to whenever you need grace, whenever you need mercy. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't you worry about what's going on in the world. You keep your eyes on the one who can warm you on your cold night. Keep your eyes on the Lord who can cool you whenever you get hot. Keep your eyes on the Lord who will fix whatever is broken. Keep your eyes on the Lord who will strengthen you whenever you're struggling. Keep your eyes on the Lord who will be with you even until the end of the world. Keep your eyes on the Lord who will always uplift you, always build you up, always guide you through, always carry you over. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Give him all the praise. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Give him all the glory. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Testify in the morning. Testify in the noon. Testify in the evening. Testify. I know somebody out there has a testimony. I know somebody out there knows what he's doing for you. I know somebody out there knows what he's done for you. I know somebody out there can sing all day about his goodness. Sing unto him. Give praise unto him. Worship him. Glorify him. Lift him up. Give his name a mighty word. Give his name all the praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His grace is unending. His peace is unknowable. His wisdom is perfect. His love is forever and forever and forever and forever. I know somebody, somebody out there knows what he did for your family. Somebody out there knows what he's doing in your life. Somebody out there knows where he brought you from. Somebody out there knows that he's too good to put in the words. Somebody out there knows that he will never leave you. He will never leave you. No matter what you're going through, he's going to bring you through it. No matter what you're dealing with, he's going to bring you through it. No matter how hard it gets, he will bring you through it. No matter how rough it seems, he will bring you through it. No matter what you're dealing with, the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations, to all households, to all lives, to every man, to every woman, to every child, to every heart, to every soul. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth.